I want to look at what Dr. Judge, uh, Jed Lake states regarding Canwright and his criticisms, and then I want to get your thoughts. So notice what he writes. He says, quote, just before Canwright left the Adventist church, he heard Butler and Smith talking about G.I. Butler appeal to Ellen White for an authoritative word on the law in Galatians 3. But he wasn't at the 1888 general conference session when she turned the attention to the delegate or, or uh, she turned the attention to the delegates back to the Bible and away from her writings as the final word on any biblical subject. Furthermore, she spelled out the final authority of the Bible in 1889, where she said, the testimonies are not to belittle the word of God, she explained, but to exalt it and attract minds to it, that the beautiful simplicity of truth may impress all. Canwright failed to notice these words. Thus, in his campaign against Seventh-day Adventism, Canwright was fighting pre-1888 Adventism, not the Adventism that has moved on to greater understanding of God's plan for humankind. His criticisms were focused on what he remembered. His charges may have been true of pockets of Adventism, but the denomination as a whole had outgrown them. Close quote. So he claims that Canwright's criticisms are essentially invalid because they are levied at an Adventism that no longer exists and has grown past the things that Canwright claimed about them, namely the charges that he made about their central focus being on the law and not Christ, as well as Ad, uh, or, uh, Ellen White openly stating that the Bible is the ultimate authority in Adventism and not Ellen's own writings. That all supposedly changed at the 1888 General Conference, and Canwright just wasn't tuned into these changes. That's why he was ill-informed. So, Steve, was 1888 really this big turning point in Adventism? that completely neutralizes any of the criticisms regarding Adventism being legalistic? Because they love to still use this defense today. For example, they'll, they'll levy this at the stuff I say all the time, that you're attacking an old Adventism that's just not around anymore. That's pre-1888, you know, righteousness by faith Adventism. What say you? Uh, gross ignorance on the part of most Adventists about 1888, uh, including Lake. Uh, I... Lake uh, teaches homiletics. Is that what he teaches? Or does he also claim to be a systematic theologian? What What are his claims? He's a professor of preaching. Preaching. Yeah. Okay. Homiletics. Okay. That's what he acts like. Uh, that's what he writes like. Uh, homileticians are not known for being scholars. And he clearly doesn't strike me as a scholar by the ignorance that uh, seems quite pervasive when he talks about 1888. Um, he, he seems to have no comprehension of, uh, you know, he, he'll take her 1901 statement at the general conference, which I used to quote too, you know, never quote my words again, go with the Bible, the Bible alone. Um, you know, that's a typical apologist thing for Ellen White if they don't want to, uh, try to defend the visions and the all the garbage that's attached to her. Um, but the bottom line is that even those statements from the 1901 general conference session where she addressed the delegates before, um, she had even her own motivations there. You know, she'd been in Australia for 10 years. She'd been colluding with uh, Daniels. They had their big plan about how they were going to come back and take over the church. And she was going to get back all these people or send her to Australia. Besides that, Anna Rice Phillips was a prophetess who was gaining great momentum in Adventism at that time. Uh, she came into major prominence after the 1888 conference, and she was embraced by Wagner and Jones. She was embraced by Prescott. She was embraced by Haskell. A number of the top leaders in the church felt like she was a true prophet, in contrast to how Ellen White was operating. And I, I would agree. I think Anna Rice Phillips uh, met the role of a New Testament prophet, that she was actually a legitimate prophetic person in the context of the New Covenant and the New Testament, which Ellen White wasn't by any stretch. I don't care how you try to argue. And uh, so Ellen comes back and Anna's getting all this attention and all these all this following. So now, oh, don't pay attention to prophecy. 
uh, just go by the Bible and the Bible alone. Ellen White already had her authority and status. You know, she already had all these books out. And when you talk about 1888, Adventists are so ignorant about this, it, it really troubles me. But um, you really have to go back to 1854 and uh, study what was happening at that time. J.H. Wagner, who was, uh, you know, E.J. Wagner's father, he wrote a book called The Law of God. And it's the closest thing to true gospel ever written by an official Adventist. <laughs> this, he understood that the law in Romans and Galatians was not the ceremonial law, as Adventists claimed, but it was the full law. It was the full Old Covenant law that you can't be under grace. You can't be under the perfect finished work of Christ and under the Old Covenant law at the same time. It's an impossibility. It's a gross mixture that's um, completely unhealthy theology, which is where Adventists have always been. Of course, early on, they were just gross perfectionists and legalists. And you have to understand that James White and Bates came out of, um, you know, the most legalistic and, and unorthodox. I mean, this was a complete, the Christian connection movement that they came out of was absolute heresy. They didn't believe in the Trinity. They didn't believe Jesus was God. I mean, they were completely heretical. And Ellen never challenged her, her husband or Bates on these views uh, while they were alive. <laughs> you know, she, she was just remarkably silent on their anti-Trinitarianism and denying Jesus as God. And she went right along with their gross perfectionism and legalism. J. H. Wagner was trying to break all this in 1854, but everyone was against him. Smith was against him. James was against him. Uh, all the other top leaders were against him. Uh, Ellen White saw that they were against him, so she claimed to have a vision that his book was wrong, and uh, they all jumped on that bandwagon and banned his book. Uh, didn't allow it to be published after that, and. Um, Wagner's son, uh, J.H. Wagner's son, E.J. Wagner, uh, worked for him at the Signs of the Times, and him and Jones were running the Signs of the Times before 1888. They were the bigwigs. They were the ones writing the editorials and everything. And they started writing the very same thing that J.H. Wagner had written back in 1854, and Smith and G.I. Butler went insane because they said, hey, Ellen White has already debunked this and already shown that this is heresy. And uh, here they are writing this in the Signs of the Times, a church paper. So Smith is writing all his editorials in the review, fighting against them. And they're having this open warfare in the church papers. And Ellen gets really pissed. And she says, we're looking like fools. You know, our, our papers are fighting against each other. And and so she told them all to shut up, basically. And uh, she said, you know, Smith and Butler are right. They're bringing up my vision, and that was my vision. So they're right, but uh, I want all of you to shut up, basically, and, and quit fighting with each other. So as soon as she says they're right to Butler and Smith, they go crazy, and they publish, Ellen White has endorsed us. We're right. She said we're right based on her visions from God, and Wagner and Jones are wrong, and Ellen just gets totally angry. Uh, she just feels totally betrayed that Butler, Butler writes a whole book on the subject, and Smith is writing editorials like mad, so she's really fit to be tied, and she's so angry at Smith and Butler that she uh, says, I think Wagner and Jones need to be able to speak at the 1888 General Conference because you guys went back on the agreement that you weren't going to continue this fight. So, you know, anyway, then she sees how popular Wagner and Jones are, but she never embraces the message of Wagner and Jones. That's where most Adventists who try to claim that Ellen White became this great gospel advocate uh, are wrong. 
Ellen White never embraced what Wagner and Jones were saying about the law. Uh, and that was their whole topic at the 80, 1888 conference, the law of God, the law of God in Romans and Galatians. That was their topic. That's what they spoke on every day. It was all that were not, you know, the, the Adventist teaching that were under the, it's the ceremonial law that's being talked about in Romans and Galatians. That's wrong. It was the moral law. It was the old covenant law. It was the whole law. It was the whole law of condemnation. That's what they were teaching. And Ellen would not embrace that because it wiped out the fourth commandment. It wiped out their claim to be the remnant and all this kind of stuff. So she just latched on to certain aspects of righteousness by faith and justification by faith that were very popular with the people. And she ran with that, getting visions of writing new books like Steps to Christ. And, oh, boy, look at all the money that can come in with Desire of Ages and you know, which is precisely what she did with this stuff. She had a whole new series of books that came out on the life of Christ, etc., all based on Wagner and Jones and the popularity they had in the church. But, you know, she lost an incredible uh, amount of credibility also because Wagner and, I mean, because Butler and Smith were saying, holy Toledo, she completely contradicted her own visions. She completely contradicted what she just said before, and that, that Wagner and Jones were wrong. Now she's saying they're right. Now she's saying they're the third angel's message in verity. I mean, it's just typical Ellen White flip-flopping for popular uh, appeal and because the masses were turned on to Wagner and Jones. So she wipes out Butler and Smith. Smith even has to step down his review and herald and go under A.T. Jones, <laughs> and uh, Butler gets kicked out of the presidency, and, um, you know, but Ellen loses a lot in that. A lot of church leaders are saying, holy Toledo, this woman is dangerous. She's a control freak. She'll, she's willing to contradict her own visions for political reasons, and uh, so let's get her the heck out of here, because the plagiarism stuff was all coming out right at that same time in the secular press in 1889. So they ship her off to Australia and she never forgets it. She's uh, quite resentful of that and makes it very clear that she didn't want to go. So she comes back with a vendetta to get rid of the uh, GC presidents and uh, the people in office and power and she puts Daniels in. And then they become uh, you know, colluding buddies up until her death. And then Daniels knows that, you know, I, I didn't bring up the fact that, um, I think that was one of your other questions, that um, Willie White knew good and well that Ellen's visions weren't what the church claimed them to be. Daniels knew that too. Almost everyone who knew Ellen White well knew that her visions were nothing like what the church was claiming. They were claiming God spoke to her, gives her all this detailed information. Willie, when he trains uh, Fanny Bolton, says, no, the visions are nothing like that. There's no words. There's no details. She gets kind of these panoramic pictures, and, um, you know, that's all there is to it. That's all the visions are. And uh, then, of course, he didn't say that she filled them in with all the plagiarisms and all the stuff she was getting from other authors. But I don't believe she got anything from God personally. You know, Willie at least was claiming that he believed that she got these kind of panoramic views. But, uh, you know, who knows what she dreamed? She was such a, uh, this was a woman who had an extreme desire to be somebody. And um, very unusual, the amount of drive and, uh, willfulness she had and control and desire for power and um, I'm sure her dreams were informed by that and of course she just made stuff up all the time too like she did with the 25 page letter against Canwrights but um, anyway I don't want to ramble too much but <laughs> there's no there there's a lot of good there um, I, I just find it interesting because as I'm reading Dr. Lake's book um, again it's kind of the same thing I was thinking regarding Alberto Tim's paper. It's, are you, do you just lack complete self-awareness? 
Yeah. The same thing you're criticizing others of doing, which in Dr. Lake's case, in his book, and even as a student, I talked with him about this numerous times, specifically regarding health message stuff. Mm -hmm. The constant criticism was, well, no, 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 no. You're taking that out of context. He's a huge, well, what's the context? The one he loves to appeal to is to say, when people say that Ellen White said, you know, you shouldn't say I'm saved, you have to understand the context. That was just re refuting the heresy of once saved, always saved. She wasn't saying that, you know, the other one they love to use. No, no. Ellen White claimed she she didn't, she never claimed to be a prophet. She said, I, I don't claim to be a prophet. Yet you go and read the quote. And in the very next paragraph, she says, because the reason why, and it's because yes. the work she's doing is far more than a prophet. <laughs> the name, pro it says the exact <laughs> yeah, I consider myself to be the Lord's messenger with, with direct messages, you know, for the people of God. So she's saying the exact opposite of what they cite the quote for. They quote it to say, well, no, she was downplaying herself when no, she was totally upswinging herself. Yes. Yeah. I'm more than a prophet. I am the Holy Spirit because I convict sin and reprove of sin. I'm also the testimony of Jesus because I yeah. am the spirit of prophecy. I mean, and if how you go, <laughs> and if you go against the shut door, you're insulting the spirit of God. Right. Absolutely. It was blasphemy against the Holy Spirit at that time. It was present yeah. truth that you had to go along with this. Absolutely.